Here's something that's really rather fascinating and a little off the beaten track, but it's not something you won't be acquainted with. Uh, because in a sense, I could have called this the wonderful world of squeaks rather than the wonderful world of harmonics. Um, because, you know, a, a squeak really actually is simply a harmonic. It's a, a rather unwelcome intruder into our sound, um, which sometimes just it's there. It's a squeak. Um, but I'd like to take you on a, a, a little tour, short but I uh, hope interesting journey into this slightly well-known uh, uncharted area of clarinet playing and saxophone playing. Um, there are a series of harmonics, which are also known as overtones, associated with every note. Uh, and these higher frequency notes sound at the same time. And although they are almost inaudible, they are partly responsible for giving our notes, our sound, its, its characteristic quality. Uh, here's a little video I made earlier, um, just to give you a little more introduction into harmonics. Well, just a few words about how harmonics work. If we take uh, a note on the piano, um, let's say this C, uh, it has a string, let's say it's this length, uh, or a similar note on the clarinet or bass clarinet. Um, when you play that note, there will be one air wave, one main air wave in the, in the tube that produces that note. It's called the fundamental. If we cut that string in half, or um, half of that wave that produced the low note, it produces a note one octave higher. So if I hold this note, if I hold the note down that's taking the damper off the string, and just play this low note, you can hear that note, because that string is exactly half the length of this string, and it is sympathetically vibrating, vibrating sympathetically. Just the same that, that uh, a note on the clarinet, it'll have one wave, exactly half that wave will be an octave higher. More about that a bit later. If we cut that string into three parts or make the air wave a third as long, the note that will sound is um, an octave and a fifth above the fundamental. Uh, and again, if I hold that note down, I'm just gonna hold two down to make it a bit stronger. If I hold that down, I'm not gonna play it, I'm going to just simply kind of play this low note. You'll hear that note vibrating sympathetically. There you are. So I'm not playing that note. I'm not touching that note at all. I'm just letting the spring, the string vibrate. And I'm playing this low note. It's exactly a third the length. The string is a third the length. Um, if I cut it into four, the note is uh, two octaves above the low fundamental. I'll hold the note down. Oops, sorry. You can hear it's quite weak, but there it is. And if we cut it into five parts, uh, the next note is actually an E, a third above the low note, uh, a third of plus two octaves. So I'm going to hold that E down and play the low note. quite weak but you can still hear it uh, and that is the basic the basics of harmonics um, every wave every fundamental has lots of overtones partials harmonics um, which are scientifically connected um, by being the first is exactly half the string or the air wave is exactly half the length and a third a quarter a fifth a sixth etc um, and um, we'll, we'll talk about more of this in a moment um, but interestingly, it has a great effect on the whole history of music, actually, because early music, the earliest music, were female and male voices singing in octaves. Then we had what's called organum, which is that second overtone. And then the big development was it became harmony, which is where they introduced the third, which is the next different overtone. Anyway, that's just a little bit of background into harmonics. These are the actual harmonics or overtones uh, on the notes of the lower register of the clarinet. Um, and the clarinet is in fact, from, a, uh, from a, a scientific point of view, known as a closed cylindrical pipe. 
know, one end is open, but the other, due to the presence of the reed and the player, is closed. Um, and so it produces different harmonics and therefore a different kind of sound from uh, an open piped instrument like the flute or closed conical pipes like the oboe or bassoon. And for reasons we don't need to go into here, the closed pipe, the clarinet, prefers the odd numbered harmonics. And this is why the clarinet's second register is a twelfth higher than the fundamental. So I think you can see in my little diagram here, the second um, is a, a rather a, a weak harmonic. We don't hear it on the clarinet. The third is strong. That's the second register. The fourth, also characteristic of an open pipe, is weak. Um, but the fifth is strong, and that is the note um, that gives us our third register. How can harmonics help us? Um, you know, knowing the harmonics of particular notes is very helpful in understanding a number of important aspects of the clarinet's behaviour. Uh, first of all, it can help us in tuning. Uh, now, here's an interesting thing. Uh, if you play your bottom E uh, and you listen carefully, you will hear this overtone. It's that B, which of course is the note we get when we open the register key. I'll play it on my instrument. I don't know whether you'll hear it um, with me playing. If you play a note into a corner of a room, you can often hear it more so. But if you listen carefully, you will hear that note. Uh, and once you've got it in your mind, then open the register key and hear the actual B. And if it's the same, then you know your clarinet is in tune. Sometimes it may not be, um, and the natural overtone might not actually be the, the, the actual tuning of that note, um, in which case we may have to make slight adjustments, um, uh, or we may indeed have to take our instrument to a, a technician who may be able to help us. Um, now repeat the exercise again, and this time see whether we can hear the next harmonic, which is the G sharp. Uh, and you can do this with a bit of practice. I'm going to play the low E, but you should be able to hear the B and the G sharp. I wonder whether you can hear it. Again, playing in a corner might do it. Let me play you those other notes. Those notes are all there in that bottom E. And again, play the low E, hear the natural harmonic of that G sharp, play your G sharp, and if it's not the same note, um, then you know it's not quite in tune. Um, if you can't, maybe, maybe listen to another player. Um, that, that often helps for you to hear it. Um, and so you can try that same exercise on other notes in the low register. It's also going to contribute to the actual tone quality, um, because some players, and I'm going to play you just a little example of a player who's, who has much harmonic sounds in his notes, um, really does give you a, 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 an improvement, a, a richness to tone quality. Uh, and when you play these low notes, if you can begin to hear the harmonic, you may be doing something with your oral cavity, with your breathing, that, that gives you more harmonically rich notes, which will contribute to the colour of the sound. And then you can really begin to explore and experiment sound in all sorts of ways. You may find you want a character that has a less harmonically rich sound for some reason or a, a more harmonically rich sound. It's fascinating. Uh, and also it's the explanation by, by uh, behind many of the notes of the altissimo register. Um, uh, you can begin to see that, that harmonics on lower notes give you the next harmonic. Uh, it's also interesting and it will help develop the use of the vocal tract. Uh, now this is really rather rather an interesting area of playing. Um, the Americans sometimes call it voicing. Uh, I'm hoping we can begin to call it voicing more in this country. Um, and very much the way that you uh, control the positioning of your tongue is going to control a lot about the sound. Uh, here's something you can just try. If we play that E in the second register, with my tongue quite low, an or sound, if I then put the tongue higher by, th by thinking R, tongue is high, and then finally E, tongue is very high, it changes the oral cavity shape, it changes the resonance of the oral cavity and the speed of the air, and we begin to get these other notes. 
I'm just going to finger the first E you see. Um, but I just got those higher notes with the same fingering. Uh, and if you work on this, if, if you fiddle around with it, um, you, you'll begin to understand the clarinet more. You'll begin to understand fingerings, where notes live. Um, and you can do it for all notes in the in the in that register, etc. Um, and and you can almost find a, another harmonic as well. Um, and uh, that that's the actual particular harmonics. But there's yet another one. I might be able to get it. Let me see. There it is. That that's the next harmonic up. And once you begin to understand this, and this is just fingering the lower note. Um, it's really going to help with 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 very high notes. Uh, you can try this again, just literally fingering the the, the Shannabo notes. Uh, I'm getting those notes just fingering the low note, the the Shalimo note, uh, and I'm beginning to understand all this stuff about um, harmonics and where they live in my oral cavity, voicing, uh, and then you can do all sorts of fun exercises. slurring between harmonics and it will just give you more understanding of how it all works uh, and, and it can also help to develop the strength of the embouchure um, for example if I play C then I play G without the register key and then I try to play other notes without the register key It's quite difficult when once you get to the low notes. I'm playing all those notes without the red sticky. Um, I can I can really do some strengthening exercises. It also is interesting in uh, the production of multiphonics. If you happen to be interested in in that kind of sound and technique um, in more modern pieces, um, it's not an area that I'm particularly interested in myself actually. But if you want to, you can do so. It also begins to give you the ability to pitch bend. bend. Um, if you think of a moving between these uh, voicings, E or, you can begin to bend notes. If you just take your mouthpiece off and play a note, it gives you approximately an E flat. That's the note of the mouthpiece. That's a very bendable note actually on the clarinet, but we can just bend it on the mouthpiece, it's easy. I'm just thinking your basically. I'm now putting my mouthpiece back on the instrument, going to that E flat. I can really bend that note really quite a lot. Um, and, and other notes, certainly in the Artissimo register, are, are equally bendable. Um, notes lower down, and do, do have a go, you'll, you'll find um, practicing this really, really rather fun. Notes lower down are, are, are bendable, not quite so much notes in the low register not so much but again interesting you learn more about the instrument uh, and finally glissando and this is where glissando starts from um, so uh, um, a bit of rhapsody in blue but uh, uh, and you'll find you can start doing all this this stuff and I just want to finish by playing you a little excerpt um, of the opening of the Mozart clarinet quintet, um, played by this American player, Ralph McLean. Uh, he's a player who is very well known for having a very, very harmonically rich sound. I don't think you'll get so much. It's quite an old recording. This It, it dates back from the 1930s, in fact. Um, but uh, I, I still think you'll, you'll catch something very interesting about the sound. He actually gave the first, or was credited for giving the first performance of the uh, Aaron Copeland concerto with a New York, um, with a Philadelphia orchestra, in fact, in, in New York in uh, 18, 1950. Anyway, um, so there it is, um, the, the, the wonderful world of harmonics. But let's just finish by listening to a little bit of Ralph McLean playing some Mozart with a very harmonically rich sound.
Well, thank you very much indeed for listening to this short talk on the wonderful world of harmonics, and I hope it gives you some interesting ideas and maybe some thoughts for further exploration and experiment.